Well, yesterday we began looking at the next section in the letter of James where in verse 11 he begins to deal with the issue of slander or I would say speaking harmfully against other people. When we talk about people in a way that disparages them or devalues them uh, in the eyes of other people and uh, creates kind of a wedge. And I think that James's big concern here was that Christians wouldn't find themselves turning on each other. And this can be kind of a, a delicate and difficult difference to make because sometimes in the church, error comes in and we find that Paul spoke out very clearly. In fact, he even named names of people who were involved in doctrinal errors who were distorting the gospel of Jesus Christ. And some Christians have uh, falsely and incorrectly conclude that regardless of bad behavior, we should never say anything. Uh, I think most recently we had uh, really, which for me was a very personally devastating uh, uh, a report of Rabbi Zachariah, a man who I greatly admired, um, and it was discovered and revealed that he was involved in some pretty hideous sinful behavior before his death. And um, it's really tough because on the one hand, uh, I have such admiration and I had so much respect for him. The idea of criticizing him was kind of painful. At the same time, we have to be careful that we fail to call sin, sin. Uh, someone once said to me, well, he's just human, so he's like everybody else. And I agree with that, that's ab absolutely true. But at the same time, we're told, as I shared yesterday out of 1 Timothy 5, that if we see a leader in error, that we need to point that out. Not that we should belittle the leader, but that we make it clear that this is not approved behavior. This is not something that should be going on. So we have to correct the person, but we can't condemn them. And that's also why I'd say that people ask me, well, do you think Rabbi made it to heaven? Well, I personally believe he did. Uh, I'll find out when I get there. But it's not my job to decide whether a person is saved or not. All I can do is share with one people what's required to be saved. You have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. That's how you get saved. Um, uh, you're not saved by behaving correctly. If that was true, none of us would make it. So thankfully, that's not the case. But at the same time, we don't want to give the idea that we're giving a pass, especially to the women who were taken advantage of and, 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 and dealt with abusively by Dr. Rav Zacharias. I mean, uh, like I say, this is emotionally a very painful thing. But as James goes on in talking about this, he says, anyone who speaks against his brother or judges him speaks against the law and judges it. Now, we have to, again, start by defining terms because what does he mean when he says speaks against his brother? And uh, the lexicon literally says it's to speak in a maligning way, to malign someone. What does the word malign mean? It means you speak with a spiteful, critical way. In other words, you're saying something intentionally designed to damage the other person. And anytime we find ourselves thinking about getting even or settling scores or putting people in their place, we're probably in sin and need to ask God to cleanse our heart before we let a word come out of our mouth. And he adds to that, not only are we speaking malignantly against somebody, but he says, or judges him. And the word here in the original literally means to judge somebody as guilty, to condemn them, to pronounce condemnation over that. That's the same word that Jesus used in, in uh, Matthew chapter 7, verse 1 in the Sermon on the Mount when he said, don't judge lest you be judged. It would be more accurate to translate it, don't condemn somebody, uh, literally saying they're going to hell, uh, lest you also find yourself being condemned by others as well. Uh, we don't want to be people who are known simply for what we're against. We want to be known what we're for. And here again, that whole concept is a balancing act because if the only thing is I'm for stuff and I'm silent on the things I'm against, that doesn't really help people to avoid error. So when we speak about things, we need to speak about very clearly what we're for, what we're seeking after, but I think we have an equal responsibility also to address the things we're against so that people can know the difference and they can judge accurately. But again, what James is not saying is that we should uh, care enough about people. Or what he is saying is that we should care enough about people that we're willing to confront them when it's necessary. I'm reminded of what Jesus said in Matthew 18 when he said, if your brother sins against you, and he says, go and show him his fault, just between the two of you. This is a private conversation initially. 
And if he listens to him, he said to you, he says, you have won your brother over. So you've redeemed and restored the relationship. But if he will not listen, and then take one or two others along so that every matter may be established by the testimony of two or three witnesses. In other words, it doesn't mean that the witnesses are coming with more proof because in order to get more proof that this person is wrong, you'd have to begin to talk about the person and expose them. And what he's really talking about is find one or two other people to go with you and to help you guys resolve this issue so that it can be discussed. In a way, they're kind of not just being witnesses of what happened, but they're being witnesses of the conversation between the two of you. And they can help you evaluate. Am I being objective? Am I being fair? Am I being judgmental? Is this person right or are they wrong? Do they need to repent or do I need to repent? That's the role of the two or three that you bring with you. But he goes on to say that uh, if he refuses to listen to them, in other words, they agree with you that this person has sinned and, and they call him to repentance and he refused to do it, it says then you need to tell it to the church. And in this context, we some churches feel that they need to make a public statement in front of the congregation. Uh, we have done that in our church when it involved people who were in staff and leadership positions. It's a very painful thing. But if it doesn't involve people in staff or leadership, it's just an ordinary person in the congregation, uh, then basically we bring it up before the elders. And it's something we say to the elder, this person has committed this sin, they've refused to uh, confess it. And so basically we ask them to come and, and state their case before the leadership. Many times people will choose just to change locations, uh, go to a different church someplace where they're not known. But the whole point is that if he refuses to listen to even the elders, he said, then treat them like a pagan and a tax collector. And what do these terms mean, pagan and tax collector? A pagan literally means somebody who is not saved, doesn't know God, doesn't know the word of God, has no regard for the things of God. You should treat him as somebody who basically doesn't believe the gospel. And that's not a judgment of whether they're saved or not, but recognize you no longer look at them as a brother or a sister in Christ because their behavior has betrayed that. Or he says the tax collector, which tax collectors were Jews who had collaborated with the Romans against their own Jewish brethren. They're traitors to their own nationality. And that's why he said, when you treat these people like traitors to the faith, it doesn't mean that you become hateful or you seek to execute them or put them to death. But what it does mean is you recognize that these are not trustworthy people. These are not people who love the truth, nor do they love the God of truth. And uh, they're friendlier with a lie and deception and dishonesty than they are with the truth. And he said, so that calls for a different kind of relationship. Well, how am I supposed then to relate to them? And that's where Paul says in Galatians 6.1, if someone is caught in a sin, you who are spiritual should restore him gently. And so the goal is to restore the person who has transgressed, not to destroy them. Uh, but he, then he goes on, he says, watch for yourself or else you may be tempted. Carry each other's burdens and in this way you will fulfill the law of Christ. Well, again, we're well out of time, uh, but I invite you to join with me tomorrow as we pick up this conversation because I'd like to talk more about this passage in Galatians 6.1. I think it has a lot of important things to say to us. God bless you and go in his wondrous grace.